I am currently working on a project with Joe Cribb, which will result in a new type catalogue of Kushan coins. Uh, people who are interested in that can note that the, cat the new catalogue of the American Numismatic Society uh, collection published by David Yongerwood is informed by the research we're currently doing. So while our catalogue is not yet available, there is an opportunity to go and see some elements of the research there. I'm going to begin by talking about this coin here. This is a very grotty photograph of a very worn coin, but it's a particularly interesting one because it was found in a place called Vaishali. And Vaishali is a small village on the outskirts of Patna in northeastern India. But the coin itself was not minted in Vaishali. The coin was minted in Begram. So it had to travel from the main mint of the Kushan Empire to an area well outside the Kushan Empire. But it didn't do that directly because this mark here is a countermark that was added to the coin in Khoresmia. Uh, so this coin left the Kushan Empire across its northern border, traveled to Khoresmia, was countermarked there where it circulated with local currency, must have subsequently re-entered the Kushan Empire and then flowed south down into the Gangetic Valley and all the way to Vaishali, um, and where it was presumably lost by somebody in the third century AD. So part of the reason that we're doing a new type catalogue is because in order to make sense of these sorts of coins, you have to be able to identify what that is and where it came from. The archaeological find alone isn't enough. In fact, it was overlooked for 40 years until P.L. Gupta realized what it was, um, both the countermark and the original coin, and was therefore able to establish its importance. These are the northern boundaries of the Kushan Empire, um, and we can see that we are into the territory that we are currently in today. One of the advantages of producing a new systematic type catalogue is that coins themselves form parts of a system. And the gaps that exist within that system provide information. So these coins are issued by the first Kushan Emperor Kajula Kadphises. They are his first issues in his homeland and they continue through most of his reign. However, he does not put his name on them. That's not a particularly unusual thing for Kushan coins. Many Kushan coins are in fact anonymous. Um, and so these have often been misattributed to a predecessor of Kajula. It's only once the coins are placed within the entire system that it becomes possible to identify them because if they were given to a predecessor, the northern part of Kushan territory would be entirely absent coinage. This is a schematic representation of the catalogue that we're engaging in and it illustrates a very interesting point. Kushan coins are not, do not initially look like Kushan coins. That's, um, it's a feature of nomadic invasions in general. To begin with, Kajula's coins are just whatever coins he encounters, just reminted, possibly with his name added, but not always. Um, so in Kajula's reign, there are lots of different mints, all producing their own coins. Here's Termes. Um, and the standardization, the creation of a specifically Kushan style is not a function of a deliberate policy to change the images, but the result of a policy of centralization. The nine mints are ultimately reduced to one under his grandson, and in the process, that mint's design becomes the standard against which all subsequent mints produce images. They copy that design. This is the design that they do, the coinage of Vima Kadphises, illustrating the standard Kushan image, standard king, god, in this case, Weisho, on the reverse. And then we come to the most famous of Kushan kings, Kanishka, um, and the source of 150 years of debate and disagreement right, over his date, who ruled in the second quarter of the second century, and his successor, Huvishka. And these are incredibly important coins, and these have been a very important focus of our research. On 
Um, for those people who aren't aware, because they're not numismatists, coins are made by striking between two dies. You hit the two dies with a hammer and impress the design on the coin. And those designs are hand engraved, so every single one of them is different. And that means that it's possible to identify exactly which tool made this coin. Um, and the sample that we have for these two kings, where on average, 10 to 20 coins survive for every die that was used to make them, is amongst the best samples in the ancient world. It's about five times better than contemporary Roman kings, Roman emperors. So most of our knowledge of how Kushan minting operated comes directly from these kings. And one of the things we learn is that the people at the mint frequently did not understand very much about what the royal cult was about. Um, so here we have the goddess Ardoxo, mislabeled as Miro. Uh, here we have one of the extremely rare examples of a Hora Mazda featuring on the coin. Um, it's very important not to mistake how often somebody features with how important they are. The mint clearly received a list of gods it could place on its coins, but it used them for a form of batch control, right? So its use of the images was not related to some imperial order. It was a decision the mint made, not the king. These are the coins of Vasudeva I and Kanishka II. Um, the importance of Vasudeva I and Kanishka II is this is the moment at which the Kushans lose control of their northern territory to the Sasanians. Um, in about 230 AD, the Kushans are defeated by the Sasanians, and another state, the Kushan Shah, is set up in their place as um, an extension of Sasanian power. And this is a Kushan Shah coin. Right? Um, it looks exactly like a Kushan coin, but we know it's not because it has the reverse design associated with Vasudeva I but the king on the front wears a kaftan rather than armor, which is the um, clothing used by um, Kanishka II. So they've married the elements of two different king's coins to maintain the local circulation of copper, right, in the way that's accepted by ordinary people. But the Kushan Empire does not stop, right, when Bactria is lost. Right? There are a series of kings who continue to rule in the Punjab and Gandhara and northwest India, right, down to the middle of the fourth century. Um, and those kings are illustrated here. Right? And, and as far as we know, and as far as the Gupta emperors testify, these kings are just as important, just as politically powerful as their predecessors, though obviously slightly more removed from our concerns here. And I will stop there. Thank you.